Hello and welcome to the 10th episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Thursday the 6th of August 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We continue with the barnstormer that is Chapter 4, The Rise of Louis Bonaparte. This week I have the new patrons Alistair Church, Kathleen Bradbury, Grim Locke, Weston, Mecha Wizard and Tenetsi user to thank. If you like today's episode and want to hear more of this type of thing, perhaps you could consider becoming a patron. For only $5 a month, you get two patron-only episodes and two patron-only live streams, the regular episodes a few days early, and the right to vote on the next reading group series. Okay, let's join the discussion. Let's try that much there, will we? I have not here to write the history of its legislative activity, which is summarized during the period in two laws, in the law of reestablishing the wine tax and the education law abolishing unbelief. If wine drinking was made harder for the French, they were presented all the more plentiful with the water of true life. If in the law, on the wine tax, the bourgeoisie declared the old hateful French tax system to be inviolable, it sought through the education law to ensure among the masses the old state of mind that put up the, with the tax system. One is astonished to see the Orleanists, the liberal bourgeois, these old apostles of voluntarianism and eclectic philosophy entrust to their her- hereditary enemies, the Jesuits, the superintendents of the French mind. However, in regards to the pretenders to the throne, Orleanists and legitimists could part company. They understood that to secure their united rule necessitated the uniting of the, of the means of repression of two epochs, that the means of subjugation of the July monarchy had to be supplemented and strengthened by the means of subjugation of the restoration. The peasants, disappointed in all their hopes, crushed more than ever by the low level of grain prices on one hand and by the growing burden of taxes and mortgage debts on the other, began to bestir themselves into the departments. They were answered by a drive against the schoolmasters, who were made subject to the clergy by a drive against the marms, the mayors, who were made subject to the prefects, and by the system of espionage to which all were made subject. In Paris and the large towns, reaction itself has the physiognomy of its epochs and challenges more than it strikes down. In the countryside, it becomes dull, coarse, petty, tiresome, and vexations, and a word, the gendarme. One comprehends in three years of the regime of the gendarme, consecrated by the regime of the priest, were bound to demoralize the immature masses. Whatever amount of passion and declamation might be employed by the party of order against the minority from the tribute of the National Assembly, its speeches remained as monosyllabic as that of the Christians, whose words were to be yea, yea, nay, nay, as monosyllabic on the platform as in the press flat as a riddle whose answer is known in advance. Whether it was a question of the right of petition or the tax on wine, freedom of the press or free trade, the clubs are the municipal charter, protection of personal liberties, a regulation of the state budget. The watchword constantly recurs. The theme remains always the same. The verdict is ever ready and and invariably reads socialism. Even bourgeois liberalism is declared socialistic. Bourgeois enlightenment, socialistic. Bourgeois financial reform, socialistic. It was socialistic to build a railway where a canal already existed, and it was socialistic to defend oneself with a cane when one was attacked with a rapier. Holy shit. Does that feel real? It's like the last two, like the Bernie and Corbyn, like this reads like the last general election in the UK, where one of the interviewers in a BBC debate, this is not a joke, she asked... One of the, I think it was Angela Raymer, and she asked her, "Do you want to nationalise sausages?" That was an actual <laughs> political question in one of the big debates. Yeah, by one Fun of the fact, BBC's we didn't have nationalised sausages until the nineteen seventies, <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or, or rather, hot dog stands were nationalised, communalised rather. Yeah, we have communes which are like municipalities, but a lot more autonomous, basically. And they were a lot more autonomous back in the day because partly because of Marx, uh, Marx and Engels were all about very local government, like the, the local community should run everything. And so that kind of 
partially grew out of out of that idea. So the the, the communes or, or the municipalities had the monopoly on hot dog stands, and all the dishes you could offer were pre-approved by uh, by a government. Were they all um, called stuff so. like the people's wurst and stuff like that? <laughs> Actually, yes, but but not in but not in that way. Like, uh, <laughs> if you would do a literal translation, uh, some of them, yeah. Fun fact: this meant that the hamburger was actually banned in Sweden. You could not legally serve a hamburger because it was not on the pre-approved list of people's hot dogs until one municipal hot dog stand had the amazing idea of claiming before court that. It was not, in fact, a hamburger. It was merely a flattened meatball <laughs> between two flatter <laughs> hot dog buns. Um, <laughs> and meatballs were approved and, and hot dogs were approved. And so the story goes, he, he actually won that case. And from then on, the, 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 the people's hamburger was invented. And up until the early 1990s, we had a state-owned hamburger chain, which was meant to compete with McDonald's. I actually remember the state-run hamburger joints, composed by the greatest minds and uh, chefs and <laughs> wow. scientists that the government could muster. Well, uh, how did it yeah. compare to a Big Mac? Similar. Similar. <laughs> Better? Um, worse? Oh, God. I, I was like seven or eight. So <laughs> Seriously, this um, is, it feels yeah. like I, I, I dozed off and I've, I'm, I'm busy <laughs> in the middle of a dream. And the dream has matched into like, you know, the Steve run hot dog stands. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's good. That's good. I better fucking ask a question now. You know, what's going on? So, <laughs> and they ban hamburgers like that. That is cause for like insurrection in the United States. <laughs> to get back on topic a little bit, one of the commenters mentioned the change of the word socialistic. But I was also thinking about how this indicated like. One of the things that seems to me about about this is that in a lot of Europe and definitely in the States and Canada, a lot of socialists started to believe this shit too. Like they just started internalizing the, the critique and just adopting it as their platform over time. And, I, you know, did that happen in France too? Like, I don't know. This is a real question. Yeah, Louis Blanc and government socialism. Yeah, but that was that was before this. So like... It was, yeah, but it, it was already there. I don't know. It's That's the socialist. That's what most people mean by socialism. And I know that doesn't, that shouldn't matter, but just, but, that's just it. <laughs> but the word, the word has changed what it means so much. I mean, I know that's why Marx is weird about when he uses it, when he distinguishes it from communism, when he doesn't. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I know, I know part of like when you read about why they called themselves the Communist League, it was because they rather sided with the British over the French on, on who they were identifying with. And the Charterists were also called Communists. So, like, are the commun the, the Charterists were, were aligned with a group called the Communists in Britain, which we forget. But, like, it does seem to me like. Like this, if you do this enough, like one of the weird thing, one of the weird counter effects is you start believing the critique, like the other side does too. I do have to step in to briefly ask the question: Does socialism equal committees plus flattened meatballs? Was Lenin wrong? The electrification of the spatula, I think, is what communism is. Two um, thirds right, one third wrong. Sorry, going back to the text a little bit here, talking about just the kind of politics that went on as opposed to, you know, the socialism stuff that everything is thrown at today. So like that the parliament under the, you know, the rule of the party of order, they brought back in all the most kind of the worst elements of, would we say, society before even the first revolution, the first French revolution, wine yeah. taxes. They brought the they brought the Jesuits back into power. They put the church teachings back into the schools. They made it illegal to teach unbelief, or did they make unbelief legal? They you know, make they, unbelief they made, illegal. Essentially, handed education over to the Jesuits, the way Marx puts it. <laughs> they yeah. seem to think if they tax the wine and get the Jesuits back, people will then be more polite in terms of paying their taxes. So the peasants were getting like shafted from every which which way. And like the tactic of, of Bonaparte was to basically just put forward frivolous shit all the time that would basically get sent down. And he was counterposed with respect to all these hard ass 
anti-Republican reforms that were done basically by the party of order. So he juxtaposed himself even more against them. So like, seriously, God damn it. This, this text is a pain in the ass because literally it just applies to every, like the politics hasn't changed. It's just basically like reading an, a good article about like the last general election in whichever country we're in. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's kind of depressing that structurally the politics, like, I don't know, structurally we're in the same place fundamentally, but like the politics of the left hasn't evolved beyond 1848. If if it's depressing as a human living through it, maybe we can take refuge in an alienated forum as intellectuals analyzing it, that we have something a little more stable by which to analyze because we have something that appears regularly throughout political life, you know, from this point forward at the very least, if we're to believe Marx and we yeah. kind of do. But it's more like we've, reg we've regressed right. all the That's way back to 1848. Saying. That's like, the point. Yeah. Well, but, Marx is talking about regression from this, like, in 1860. <laughs> like, I mean, when I was reading the reflections in 1860, he was talking about in the international, like he had the, he had the couch's language more because we had already regressed from, from the points where he was writing yeah. this. So like, and this is, this is, you know, talking about regression, but like four or five years after the fact. So like you have immediate, you have immediate regression. Like if you, if you look at the, if you don't look at the economic situation, but you look at political situation, it does like lead you to like, maybe the degeneration theory may be correct or something like it's. What's that theory? That capitalist political forms are actually degenerative because like they're overripe and they've been overripe since they pretty much existed. The idea is essentially that the reason that Marx's politics don't seem to work after like a certain period is because in most cases, it's usually the idea that the productive forces have developed to the so much technology that it like it overgrew just the period where you could consign feeding the entire you know area to 5% of the population and have other people do other shit, which is sort of the groundwork for socialism. At least that was Bordiga's read of it. I think it's a good one. And then it like over ripened to the point where it developed like security states and nukes and just like, no, nope, none of this is going to help us. This is all just going to keep the situation in place. Fuck, we missed our window here. Uh, we can't, we're not going to be able to use Marx's political strategy anymore. It's a, it's basically one of the things in left communist theory that allows you to be like an orthodox Marxist and basically just throw out everything Marx said about political strategy. Yeah, everything. But the other the other thing about it that I think is interesting is it, it can lead you to someplace else. It can lead you to Hotel Grand Abyss. Yes. Yeah, well, right. that's, I think, what is suggested to most people when they hear it, not like, <laughs> oh, good, now we have to pursue new strategies. It's, it's um, you know, Edward Munch is a scream. I mean, you, ju you just think, like, Adorno and Herkheimer forever, like, are, like, or like uh, Orwell's, you know, ranting at the end of 1984. I mean, it's just, it's right. super, it's a super bummer. Yeah. So, uh, someone in the chat said that this, the secret, when we were saying Marx was racist, said, oh, is this, why is the secret service here? But this is the real secret service, Qu you know, question in Marxism. Like, are we sure this just isn't like function to actually paralyze people in doubt and fear? Like, I don't know. It seems to me that, just on a very on a very small scale, if you look at the question that kind of people that were all in for Bernie are saying, they're actually kind of going to they realize something about the political game. So, like, I don't I don't see it as an end game. I don't I don't think that this. I I think that the there is definite movement. Like, we're all Marxists. Do we all think the capitalism is the last social form ever? It's the end of history. Do we actually believe that? If we don't believe that, then we can't oh. believe that that other theory. No, but what we don't believe is that, and you know, this is something we've kind of worked out, or at least a lot of, maybe a bunch of us don't believe that the orthodox Marxist, quote unquote, electoral strategy works. It's rather that like, there's like a Marxian politics that wasn't as like sanguine on using the, exec the existing executive that is a living tradition. Other than the Leninist I said, one? Yeah, I said I said living. The only place Leninism lives is, you know, under to to get rich is glorious, you know. Lenin lives. Lenin lives. Okay. Lenin laughs, Lenin loves.
Right, now we're all the way up to Mr. Bombastic, semi-fantastic himself, Kyle. Do you want to hit the next? Uh, <laughs> wow. Do you like that intro? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Okay. Thanks. This was not merely a figure of speech, fashion, or party tactics. The bourgeoisie had a true insight into the fact that all the weapons it had forged against feudalism turned their points against itself that all the means of education it had produced rebelled against its own civilization, that all the gods it had created had fallen away from it. It understood that all the so-called bourgeois liberties and organs of progress attacked and menaced its class rule at its social foundation and its political summit simultaneously, and had therefore become, quote-unquote, socialistic. In this menace and this attack, it rightly discerned the secret of socialism, whose import and tendency it judges more correctly than so-called socialism knows how to judge itself. The latter can, accordingly, not comprehend why the bourgeoisie callously hardens its heart against it, whether it sentimentally bewails the sufferings of mankind or in Christian spirit prophesies the millennium and universal brotherly love or in humanistic style, twaddles about mind, education, and freedom, or in doctrinaire fashion, invents a system for the conciliation and welfare of all classes. What the bourgeoisie did not grasp, however, was the logical conclusion that its own parliamentary regime, its political rule in general, was now also bound to meet with the general verdict of condemnation as being socialistic. As long as the rule of the bourgeois class had not been completely organized, as long as it had not acquired its pure political expression, the antagonism of the other classes likewise could not appear in its pure form, and where it did appear could not take the dangerous turn that transforms every struggle against the state power into a struggle against capital. If in every stirring of life in society it saw tranquility imperiled, how could it want to maintain at the head of society a regime of unrest, its own regime, the parliamentary regime, this regime that, according to the expression of one of its spokesmen, lives in struggle and by struggle? The parliamentary regime lives by discussion. How shall it forbid discussion? Every interest, every social institution is here transformed into general ideas, debated as ideas, how shall any interest, any institution sustain itself above thought and impose itself as an article of faith? The struggle of the orators on the platform evokes the struggle of the scribblers of the press. The debating club in Parliament is necessarily supplemented by de debating clubs in the salons and the bistros. The representatives who constantly appeal to public opinion give public opinion the right to speak its real mind in petitions. The parliamentary regime leaves everything to the decision of majorities. How shall the great majorities outside parliament not want to decide? When you play the fiddle at the top of the state, what else is to be expected but that those down below dance? You know what is amazing about this to me is that the whole degeneration in America of, you know, conflating socialism and liberal can actually sort of be explained in this paragraph. Yes, like wow like you've gone so far with your denouncing all all you know public institutions to maintain your own class power to the point that the difference between liberalism and socialism really is obscured even in places like sweden where we have committees to flatten meatballs <laughs> well, if you're to carry the humanist torch this was just more accurately perceived in places like sweden where they named their you know bourgeois state apparatus after Marx stuff because they're trying to be kind of socialist, you know, like it's instead of in a way in, in, in America, like it's kind of refreshing that we all coded all of our Keynesian class compromise as being anti-Marxist because, you know, in a way it provides like a better read of history. But if you really took the enlightenment very seriously, if you really took humanism very seriously, if you cared more about humanism than the enlightenment even, like, if you really, like, expand it and extrapolate it based on everything we know about human beings, it's hard not to be a socialist. Like, if you really take those principles seriously. If you look at humanism and go, social Darwinism, maybe? You know, like, I think that's a path out of humanism. <laughs> 
if, if you're really faithful to the principles of humanism, you do get to socialism. And therefore that's the, that's a big problem for a thinker, right? Like it's a problem that Einstein became a socialist. Well, it's, it's interesting to me because it, does, it you, you now kind of see that thing that people throw off that when Marx wrote to Lincoln, when he said that, you know, the liberal revolutions can't finish themselves and this is yeah. why, like this is where he explicitly states why instead of just saying it in a vague way. And already the members of the party of order, when they were writing their intellectual trees, were deploying the arguments of social Darwinism without the Darwinism. They were making appeals to God and stuff like that uh, instead of Darwin. But the core of the argument was already being expressed in bourgeois political economy quite commonly. Right. And so you flipped God and Darwin. It's funny that you see both the, the virtuous sort of like humanist process of becoming a socialist and like the ugly process of the conflation of any, you know, anything the state does with socialism that we end up with. But uh, fire, fire engines are socialist, aren't they? <laughs> There's fire engines. We also have fire hoses. I think fire hoses are also socialists. Oh, those are full communists. It's combined in uneven development. Oh, okay. They're communists. Okay. Yeah. Fire hydrants now. I'm not sure where they, where do fire hydrants sit on this spectrum? They're social fascist, but they'll come around. They'll come around. Okay. One bit is interesting. He says about how the, because the capitalist faction like Party of Order is split between the Orleanists and the legitimists, that because that they weren't kind of united, obviously in as pure, in a political form as capital, that the socialists couldn't basically realize their true enemy in capital. That's an interesting insight that's probably more historical now than it gives us any insight. What do people think? I think from my experience with sort of capitalist one party states, that this is like, it doesn't really point to any kind of political trajectory because the one party state will always subdivide itself into factions and that becomes the substance of politics. So you're never really going to have, unless you have like a true dictatorship, like they had in Mexico before the Mexican Revolution, you're never really going to have that pure representative of capital to take on in a, any kind of like parliamentary system, even if they're in the same party. I was actually thinking about that for like why we keep on getting stuck with like, you know, people call it tepid social democracy or whatever. But I, I actually do think like in, in the case of the United States, you do have the, the factions of capital are effectively split. And it makes it look like one is more progressive. I mean, one is more progressive than the other, but like it makes it seem like there isn't like they aren't both factions of capital when like, I mean, let's look at the way the Democrats work. They clearly are. They share the values of finance, of, of finance capital largely. And then a, a weirdly coalition of like petite bourgeois shit and educational institutions and stuff that's quasi that's, you know, servicing capital and then like high tech as well. They're, they're Silicon Valley too, aren't they? Right. As opposed to like traditional Sunbelt industries and like, it's pretty clear what's going on there. And Marx, I mean, Ingalls was really worried about that in America. Like he was always writing about how like that plus currency schemes, plus the like yeoman fascination would make it very hard for there to ever be a worker, like a workers party there that got anywhere. Even though the one of the first labor parties was actually attempted in the US, it just didn't last. So the Democratic Party, they're basically like, the party of uh, monopoly rents. Is that what we're saying? They're the party yeah. of finance and people who can get patents. And they then do. the Republicans are more the party of production. R real estate? But that's a rent. Are, are, are Democrats real estate? No. Th well, they're both real estate, actually. I mean, in California, Democrats are actually are heavily into real estate. But the whole economy is rents out here. I mean, there's some production. It's true. But there's... there's, right. there's a lot of rent activity. So it's more divisions between types of rentiers than it is like the rent party nowadays versus the production party. Right. I mean, it probably was the production party versus the rent party at one point. Also the, the Democrats were the party. I mean, the Democrats were the party of slavery and of decentralized order. The, the Democrat Republicans were. 
And I mean, they affect when the Whigs totally bombed out in the second party period in the United States. Like, they for a while they pretty much were the only party, and they split sort of. I mean, they, they sort of like they split and reabsorbed the Whigs, and that's where the Republicans come from. You see this over and over again, though, where like it looks like there isn't. It looks like one of the parties is more progressive, and thus there's like socialists have an ally in government, but they clearly don't and can't. Uh, I was thinking about monarchic systems and how this this antagonism manifests itself. And it really manifests itself in the way of court in intrigue, right? So even in a monarchic system, you're going to have people say like, ah, this minister or this courtier is the progressive one. Maybe we can ally with them, right? Like we see that in the Russian Revolution, the development of the Russian, Russian Revolution. So th this, is, this problem is never uh, entirely eliminated, even in a monarchic capitalist order. To sort of bring the discussion back to this uh, paragraph a little bit, what, what really struck me as truth was how snarky Marx is against, like, really exi existing socialists. The socialists are like, why? We're on their side. All we want is, you know, universal health care. And the bourgeoisie was for that. That's not a socialist idea. That's a liberal idea. And, you know, why are the bourgeoisie always fighting against us on what should be, you know, follow naturally from or even implement the exact same policies that they did just t literally two years ago? You know, why, why are they fighting against us? And, and, and Mark's making the point that, you know, goddamn socialists the, the bourgeoisie understands why you have to be inconsistent like or intellectually inconsistent and why you're the enemy but you don't understand <laughs> you know who the real enemy is here i just thought that was that was kind of very very apt and also like how the how socialism like that socialism uh, how that was already a slur when this was written and for the exact same reasons i mean when I read this, I was just like, it, it actually frightened me because I was immediately struck by a very sort of apocalyptic feeling or like nihilist feeling that like nothing has happened. Like this is still the best take on, on contemporary politics or even like last week's politics in, right. you know, country X. <laughs> and, uh, but I don't think yeah. like... I, I don't think this take, if you if we were alive in 1920, we wouldn't think that it was describing 1920s politics. Yeah, I, I, was, I mean... Revolutionary I, politics was alive, so we shouldn't think that from 1848 to today. It's like that our, our it, political cycle has reverted back to a social democratic I, 1848. Well, so, social democracy was huge in the 1920s as well. Yeah, but so was revolutionary stuff. That did like, not, you know, in the, not in any core capitalist country on earth. Well, they had revolutions, Derek. And they also, lost. also, so, so they lost. Uh, yeah, also, they I would, them. I would, I would push back on you a little bit on that, Tom, because even if that were true, so, it is so true. even, even if, well, all right, fine. Let's, for the sake of argument, I'm accepting that proposition. But like, even those revolutionary movements. What he talks about here about how can you how can you ban debate when you're supposed to be council driven or whatever? There, there's still a lot in this paragraph that would apply to those revolutionary movements as well. Fair enough, but I I just feel like I I feel like that our political moment in in the West, you know, right now is very much kind of like 18 this period it feels like this periodization where like if you were to go to 1920s 30s in europe it wouldn't feel like the political situation mapped so neatly onto this that's my point I mean, I, yeah well I, okay i th that i do agree with i agree with you with, with some interesting things about the the kinds of socialism he's condemning here because we're focusing on on like like the standard bourgeois one but the other one i found interesting is trying to keep the classes together because that's true in all of them, including the USSR, because of the nature of the peasant petty proprietor relationships. I mean, like, it's it leads to the base between Bakar and, and Trotsky. Like, it's already there, even there. And that, and like, oh my God, if you're talking about that, even if you think China is somehow actually socialist or, I mean, maybe socialist transitioning or something like that, you want to talk about class corroborationist politics? 
like explicitly. I mean, you it's in the really, flag. Yeah, it's it's literally in the like the yeah. mask line argument is a class collaborationist argument. <laughs> like, yeah, but the, the mask line at least has this uh, appeal to uh, the people or something, and not not literally being like we actually need to represent a section of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> The Rousseauian people is more vague about it, I guess. That's that's superior in a way because if you just do numbers, the people or something is it's not like listen. We have to make sure the local bourgeoisie gets a cut. I just have to say that you know the 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 one movement that is kind of consistent on this, not anywhere near consistent with capital C, but at least kind of consistent, more consistent than the general debate is like hardcore libertarians because they will call out bailouts as socialism, you know, corporate welfare, blah, 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 as socialism, the military industrial complex, that's socialism. Right, Keynesianism. Um, but, but Manuel, do you ever hear them talking about like hoses, water hoses? They never mention the water. They leave out the water hose always. They never mention hydrants either. Well, that's, that's, that's not <laughs> true, Tom. That's not true. They, ha- they do talk about that. They, they actually... Yeah. You talk about privatizing fire emergency services. Yeah, that does and, come and, up, but, but that's the actual history of that in the U.S. too. <laughs> like, we used that's, to do- that's kind of fringe, though. <laughs> and what isn't fringe yeah, was granted. Romney Care is communism. You know that ended up being a real thing. Wait, I don't for know. real? Well, you know Romney Care. You know the individual mandate, private, public partnership, health care system with a public sure. option. Right, that Romney pitched in Massachusetts as a sort of centrist, you know, Republican way of. I think it was a Cato Institute that yeah. came up with uh-huh. this, or the yeah, Rand yeah, Corporation Institute, not the Cato. Excuse, me. Excuse me, heritage. It was heritage. Yeah, heritage. Holy it's shit! Heritage so it's even worse. Well, oh my god! Like, but so this Heritage Foundation healthcare proposal that was implemented by a Republican governor was picked up as the Democratic alternative to actual universal health care. That's why I said Romney care at first is because once, once you call it Obamacare, it's socialism oh. now, right? Sorry, I was just going to build off a few points that have been made. It's in the UK, it's such an obfuscation because of the role that the Labour Party plays. And we're seeing it now in the context of COVID-19 that you know landlords here can apply for a mortgage holiday and yet renters are not in any way being protected. So that should be a logical position for the Labour Party to defend. And yet they're not. They're just moving to defer it. And they're still seeing Starmer was like in the Telegraph last week. And I took a lot of screen grabs of like Telegraph subscribers going like, I've cancelled my subscription. There are communists in the Telegraph. So you have, you know, a party of bourgeois liberalism who aren't even protecting what should be some of their, you know, core demographic voters still being perceived within that society to be like, you know, communists is completely insane. I think it's quite good because it allows people to actually become p- communists. Because if they see if you're even going to be milk toast, you're going to be called a communist. It's like, I, I do think genuinely people will just go, right, I'm a fucking communist. And I, I, I do think, I wonder, is there, is there some of that? Is that, is that something that we'll, we will see happening in society? Like, because to be honest with you, when I was in college growing up, you know, in the 90s in Ireland or something, I swear to Jesus, I never heard the word socialism, you know, I'd never heard it. I remember I was in, I was in, I was in Hyde Park in like 2008 with my mate who came over. He liked to go into Speaker's Corner and he was like, there was a Marxist guy there, a, a trot, and he was talking about like socialism and my, my mate was arguing with him and I was like, kind of, I was like kind of going to myself, what's socialism? I, I don't know what that is. I'm t- literally about 12 years ago. I don't know. Maybe there's something to it. I think this is actually why parlor Stalinism is coming back more than like a consistent socialism. Because if you're trying to freak out people who are calling you commies, you just go find the obvious historical model for who these people are comparing you to. And so, you know, who you're going to look at, you're going to look, you know, if you're right wing, you're going to, if you're slightly right wing inclined at all, you're going to look towards Nazism. If you're slightly left-wing inclined at all, you're going to look towards the historical high period anti-revisionist communism. And we've seen that happen twice in the United States where that kind of pops, flows up as a meme. It lasts for about five years and dies. It doesn't lead to a real movement. 
No, that's true. That's true. I know in, in the private yeah. chat there, you're saying I need to incur my enthusiasm <laughs> or opportunism. You may, I'm not being opportunist. What are you on about? I, I was, be, I was, I was, I was, uh, I was making a joke because I, I, it doesn't seem like you're actually being oppor- like, I don't think you're actually being opportunistic, Tom, but I do think like there is a certain amount of like, look, if we can only like, I was, people were really telling me the other day or not the other day, like, like before COVID hit, but right after Bernie lost in that like two week period that we needed to all rush into the DSA and then turn it communist because now we've taught them that electoralism doesn't work the way they think. And now we have to turn it into a, a mass workers party. Now, and, and interesting, the DFA, the DSA's numbers have grown for the first time in two years. And I know that because of when they stopped reporting their numbers and when they picked it back up. So they haven't been reporting their numbers for two years. And then this month they reported in March, they grew by 10K which if in they are at uh, 66,000 members but if you actually figure that out the timeline and looking at when they report it means they had no growth and maybe declines in growth for the last 2 years and i only bring that up because that's the kind of thinking that it leads to is like we can just rush in and we can do this really fast and yeah well it's that's obviously you know rubbish isn't it there's no social base or anything it's it's just the same answer again you're relying on like the free play of the sign, you know, that someone goes socialist, huh? You know, and to be fair, this happened to me that over time, I went from, I like libraries to, you know, eventually distinguishing between, you know, socialism as, you know, liberal capitalist management to some kind of a bespoke Marxian communist content or something. All because at first there was a word socialism that I engaged with, but like, that's not really dealing with the underlying thought patterns that brought me here and the quality of the socialist commitment that you get by watering it down so much is questionable. That's a nice way to say it. I came from the opposite trajectory, whereas I was, you know, I was so into libertarian right wing movements and that ideological consistency I guess I realized that Locke's proviso on land was impossible, and then it broke my brain. And then I started looking into the what was going to be the precursors to the housing crisis. And then within three years, I was a, some kind of weirdo Marxist. But most people don't operate under that consistency. Most people operate in their immediate interests. I don't know what I'm getting on that, but it does seem it does seem to me like that that, that can work, but it only works temporarily if there's nothing for it to really go into how you would build a social base what kind of principles would it have etc otherwise it doesn't make it seem like marx is just ranting at the holy poloi all the time like like what he's saying about other socialists it's like okay marx we get it but why do socialists always do that what reason does it have that we degenerate so consistently in such similar ways for 200 years if we do that then like what can we do about it and that's more disturbing to me. I mean, that does lead me into like analytic Marxist on one end, Frankfurt School thought on the other, where it's like, oh, it's all bad. Well, one thing I would say is that like, just, you know, looking at the kind of normy socialist lefty stuff that I'd listen to and, and some more kind of radical stuff, say a lot of them are basically kind of going further after what happened with Corbyn and Sanders. A, a lot of them are. So the media that is very popular, like even Chapel, listen to the stuff that your man, Matt Christman, Matt, what's his man, Chris, Christian? Matt Christian, is it? That he's doing these uh, vlogs on like, I think like dialectics or something, you know, talking about how you want to go and get grilled up or something. I don't know, some really insane kind of <laughs> metaphor for but like the and things like the the trillbillies workers party like popular podcasts left things that the that the material conditions in them is moving what they say and what they're debating and thinking about to more along the lines of what we talk about and i, I think that that is a sign of something within society probably changing maybe going towards some of the more influential socialists thinking about socialism in a more Marxian than a social democratic trend, we might see more of it. I get that feeling that that, that shift is occurred from the media that I consume in the last few months. 
I, I think that that's true to an extent, but just picking up on what Derek said about the DSA, I mean, there's there's something fairly analogous happening here in the momentum, which was the organization that kind of existed as a organizational faction within the Labour Party, has they've almost had like a refoundation. But once one group came forward saying, we will refound momentum along these principles and lines, immediately a second and then a third group emerged. And it's really difficult when we have these conversations on this text. <laughs> It kind of takes us back to McNair in so many ways in that because they kind of think that oh, what, what we learned from the Corbyn period, we could take some of those lessons and we just need to do it again, but more. But then there's also kind of ideological disputes within what is already quite a small group that's splintering. And that's before you even take into context what we're discussing in terms of they're not actually being a lot of the social base and a workers movement to actually kind of catalyze any of that activity. So it is it's kind of frustrating to watch that happening while we're discussing these things in the abstract. And it does lead to kind of, I don't know, senses of kind of uh, fatalism within me. Well, it, it just, it's just, it's people caught up in political logic going further into the political logic that we need. You know what we need? We need exactly the right formation of what you call a momentum. If we just had momentum slightly betterly done, we'd have uh, socialism in the UK. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's a bad, bad, bad argument. Derek's probably uh, gone off thinking, I think the revolution's going to come. Derek is Derek is much too uh, depressive you know, about these type of things. Derek, you got to come to the light. Come to the light. I'm a revolutionary pessimist, which at least I'm still revolutionary. I haven't gone full Adorno. I haven't wrote my version of Resignation yet. If anyone has read that essay, you should, because it's when Adorno just basically says, the only communism we're fighting for is in my head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say in my bed. No, well, say, you well, know, well, sure. yeah, yeah. no, I, I have been, I, I am more pessimistic only in so much that, like, when you study the patterns of the 20th century, we've been at this moment a couple of times. We were at this moment in 19, between the, the like 65 and, and, and 75, and ooh, did it not yeah. go well? It didn't go well, but like the, the whole thing is like, if we think of like from, you know, the whatever you call it, the thousand year stare or whatever people call it. It's like, you know, the capitalism, then the dynamics of it throws up these repeated problems and generations try and strategize to fix it. And they fucked it up the first three or four cycles. But like the cycles are, I think, uh, keep coming. And it's not inevitable that you keep fucking up the same. You, you you keep doing it wrong. It's not inevitable, or else what's the point? You know, this to me, this does lead me to think about like a lot of the ex-Marxist conservative critics of Marxism who sit, who kept on saying that like, well, you get part of what you guys have wrong is you're not doing proper class analysis anymore. That's why a lot of the, the a lot of the Italian Marxists became fascist, and a lot of the paleo conservatives who were come out of Trotskyism are went similar ways with their managerial theories. And I, I do think like we have to, if, if we say there's a materialist explanation for this, we actually kind of have to look at that stuff and at least consider it because, because it does seem like we, we are like, well, you know, we have a merger formula and a workers movement, but kind of, and, but it never, even when the workers movement had a real social base, the merger never really happened in a place where it should have. And I, that's why I'm more. That's why I'm more pessimistic because there was supposed to be. Did it not happen in Germany? Not. No. Actually, here's what happened. Like the, the, the Sparks and the the Social Democrats were effectively split the working class. I actually talked to a German scholar who said that I was misinterpreting some things, um, that I was wrong on some things, basically because I had my timeline premature. Like that, I you know, and one of the sources didn't tell me like when the the communists were mostly like Catholic and unemployed. That, that actually didn't wasn't how they originally stood off, but it divided the, the the working class up against itself pretty quickly, and also within factions within the, the the social democratic movement, and that really can't be ignored. And then if you read somebody like Adam Perowski, it gets really dire when you like start doing out when you start doing game theoretical calculus on this. When we brought this up before, but it does seem like there is a there is a way this breaks down when you assume certain conditions that are assumable in parliamentary capitalistic democracies that we can't seem to get past. We haven't 
theorized way out of it. And so we're likely to regress to the same things we've done before. Right. And so it's looking at that regular sort of pattern situation and, you know, essentially looking for ways where one of those rules can be broken and we can have like a different calculus take hold because there were situations where there is a merger of the workers movement and the socialist intellectuals and they led to, you know, social democratic politics. They didn't lead to revolutionary communism. You have to like be in a situation where that kind of social democracy, it's not really like pl plausibly going to deliver the goods while having workers power in the way that they, you know, they, they had some, some sort of, of economic say in society. It's, it's not hopeless. It's just, this is why we live in capitalism. We have to reverse engineer why we're in capitalism before figuring out the, the new strategy or something. It's, it's not, it's, it's only pessimistic because we live in the past, you know, everything else has to have not worked. That's why we're here. <laughs> Yeah, I'd be cr I'd be crazy surprised in twenty years in somewhere like Britain or America there is not or France there's not a another at least a nineteen sixty eight moment where like I mean in Paris nineteen sixty eight moment. Look, look at the unemployment figures. Yeah, but that's temporary. That that's just temporary. I think it's oh, more Tom. the political dynamics. Oh, Tom. No, okay. okay, obviously, no, no, I'm not. I'm not being facetious. I'm obviously being a bit facetious. You know, I think like you might end up with five to ten, ten percent, ten percent unemployment. I mean, like we we've never seen anything quite like this in modern memory, where the government basically inflicts that economic crisis on itself. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, well, the thing is, like, though, how, how how do you mean it? It inflicts it on itself. Well, they didn't handle the, the thing straight the proper right way. Right. They did they didn't do no, but but, but, but like, even countries who did are it, very affected. Yeah, but they're not right. gonna be as affected as the UK or, or America or the fucking America. United States is gonna be oh, I, I mean that that remains to be seen. The, the Yes, you're we right. Live in a I'm global economy. A I'm making a prediction. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and if the purchasing power of the U.S. falls, I mean, that could hit South Korea very badly, who who managed it perfectly. I mean, there's, I, I, I think, I think one should be very careful to say that countries who handled who handled it very well will be better off than than those who didn't. I on average, it, on average, on average, it'll be better off. On, like, on average, it will be better off in some metrics, yes, but but like, it, it, we live in a global economy. Is all I'm saying. I'm, I'm aware of that, like, but I'm talking about the potential for unrest in the United States is like, we were already in a tremendously cynical situation and this is something else. I, I mean, when, when you guys can get access to guns, but you can't purchase toilet paper, I mean, that, that says a lot of, <laughs> about the, the level of how much shit might be going down. Uh, yeah, and you so, know, yeah, like yeah. the way the way employment figures are. I, listen, I know it's it's very sui generis. It's something that that deep a slope, that negative a slope in employment figures it just doesn't fucking happen. Like for the well, most part in well, cap in American capitalist history, we're not even looking at all the countries that we, like. So we're we're talking about this. I, mean, I want to bring up Russia for a second. Maybe Russia, maybe, Russia, Russia. Like really make you like put some pause on the stuff. The situation in Russia is that not only is COVID affecting them, but the, their oil subsidies for their entire government has been wiped out. And to keep their exports up, they're keeping the prices high in their own country. This is huge. And I don't think I'm not as optimistic as Tom because I'm not, you know, I don't work in the same sectors. But I think this is going to this is going to be really devastating for a much longer time than people think, because it's not just the service sector shutdown that's going to affect everyone. What worries me in the terms of this is historically the social democrats have been right in saying that that mobilization of workers does not generally happen in an in an immiserated time unless there is a fully developed socialist movement already there. It developed during better time periods to pick it up. We kind of have that, but not really, and not not in mass. It does seem like there's a real divide between the kind of people who do politics in all of our countries and 
and the kind of people you would need for a workers' movement. Like, there's a huge divide. So basically, what we're saying here is that we need a merger of not the not the socialists and the workers' movement. We need a merger between the DSA and Marxist Center. Is this is this what we're saying? <laughs> I, th I think this is what we're saying. Hundred percent, obviously. I mean, when I think of you know where the beating heart of the working class is, we need a merger between the CBGB, PCC, and SWP. This is what we're saying. And no, you, but you for, you forgot. Uh, I don't know. Insert like crank Maoist party here. You forgot the PSL, Tom. Well, it is interesting to compare the formation of the first, and then we're really off topic, and we should get back on. <laughs> compare the first, yeah. the, the formation of we the first high. internationals. And the second one, because the second one was coalitions of parties. There were socialist ideological parties. But the first international was a coalition of whatever fucking organization had workers in it. And the parties literally came from coalitions of unions that banded together to form political parties. In most countries, this seems to have been like it doesn't seem possible for that to happen now. And so the even the precursing the precursor movement where you had this coalition on the first international that led the second international to actually have some legitimacy in claiming a relationship to the work to merge with. That's really not there. And one of the things I got frustrated with the more I've been studying since we did the McNair thing, and it's going to come up and to me, it's coming up in this is that um, there's a skipping over that the coalition of unions into the labor and social democratic parties because we don't like the implications of where that politics went, but also because Though I think everybody really knows those really aren't there. And what's even more interesting about it is when that happened, those groups were illegal. So you can't even say it's like totally the legal thing that's preventing it from happening. It's something else. James, have you been wanting to get in or out there? No, no, I was just going to say you were correct at the big, at the top when you said that it's quite a dense chapter. <laughs> and yes. we've, we've, as usual, kind of uh, sprung off in many multiple directions. We learned something about uh, the hot dog scene in 1970s Sweden that we weren't really, like, we weren't aware of. I must say, we were kind of surprised. Emmanuel, you pulled that one out. I, I actually looked it up, and it was actually the, the 1950s, uh, 50s and 60s, but, but still, yeah. That's, um, that's what I was thinking. That's why I was thrown. I was thinking, is that not yeah, the yeah. 1950s Swedish hot, it, it, hot dog it, it, yeah, scene? Yeah, it, it, it was not the 70s. It, okay. It was, it was a bit earlier. But yeah, you got yeah. to taste um, it side by side with a Big Mac. It had actually been privatized by the time. How about that? They crap. privatized the state-owned hamburger chain. That, that yeah. tells you a lot about Sweden in the 1990s. Man. Disaster. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say it with, with all loving intent that Marx's point about parliamentary inaptitude and that they debated the railway for, for almost two years being a sign of why the parliament couldn't do anything could apply to a lot of this episode. <laughs> and I, I, I say that with brotherly love for all of us and, and all of y'all, but like still <laughs> we got stuck on one paragraph for an hour and a half. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I mean, when this we is started this reading about politics, too, but... we went in a very ADD direction, but apparently communist parties, more than one in central Europe have listened to that series for advice on what to do, which is amazing. If you're listening right now, that's not a diss. That is like, I'm I'm so like, I just, I don't know what to say about, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't feel like I have an, a lot of answers after reading a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you know, hopefully these stories lighten the mood while we're saying that, yeah, everything hasn't worked. There's no reason to despair just because that stuff didn't work, you know? something could work we need something to work we're humans life finds a way what we need is a is a somebody's traveling from the future a revolutionary hero into the into our present and mimics somebody who just got killed or something and then starts mm. but like to like mm. the mood uh, I still have would, my... would, would you be referring to captain benjamin cisco uh I perhaps <laughs> you mean uh, yes, gabriel I... bell gabriel bell yes uh... On this episode, you heard the theme tune, 
The Order of the Phronic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.